I'd like to welcome everyone this afternoon to another installment in our extended celebration of uh, Charles Darwin and evolution. Today's event is sponsored by the Kelvin Smith Library in which we're sitting and by the Institute for the Science of Origins, uh, which is a, a new institute on campus directed by Glenn Starkman. I'm delighted to have as our speaker today, Professor John Van Wy, who is a Bi Fellow at Christ College, Cambridge, an affiliate of the Department of History and Philosophy of Science, and a historian of science who has devoted much of his uh, considerable energy to, uh, although not all of it, to Charles Darwin and Darwin's lifetime of uh, scientific inquiry. John has uh, published a couple of books already, not on Darwin, but has three new books coming out this year, uh, all relating to Darwin, demonstrating his ability to adapt. He has also published a number of scholarly articles and uh, book reviews and articles of general interest. Uh, perhaps his most distinctive achievement in this era of uh, the looming dominance of the internet is the founding and directing of a website uh, referred to as the Complete Works of Charles Darwin Online. So it is a distinctive pleasure to invite John up to the lectern to deliver his address entitled Charles Darwin, The True Story. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the uh, gracious invitation to come here. It's a great honor for me. Well, yes, this is, uh, do we have a double microphone? OK. Well, this is the, uh, the great bicentenary year of Charles Darwin, 2009. I've been dreading it for years. And here it is. And it includes an unprecedented amount of attention to Charles Darwin, an unprecedented number of documentaries, an unprecedented number of films, an unprecedented number of mugs and t-shirts uh, <laughs> devoted to Charles Darwin, and of course, an unprecedented number of books and magazine articles, newspaper articles, reviews, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Hundreds, I mean, no one knows how many have been published on Darwin in this year. I myself am guilty of three or four. I mean, the, <laughs> the little one uh, in the top left corner is sort of half a book. It's just a little booklet. Uh, so, all of this goes to show that it's not a historical accident, it's not a mistake that Charles Darwin is considered to be a big deal. Because 100 years ago this year, in 1909, there was a great Darwin centenary celebration all around the world, spontaneous, not organized by anyone. And it was said at the time that it was an unprecedented celebration of a single scientist. And now 100 years after that, it can certainly be said again with truth that we are witnessing the unprecedented commemoration and celebration of a single scientist. What a special man he must have been. Unfortunately, very much of what most people hear about Charles Darwin or believe about Charles Darwin is incorrect. And I think this year is a particularly apt time to actually revisit Charles Darwin's life, have a look again at what he actually wrote, what he actually said, and what he actually did and try and clear up some of these, these persistent myths. So, in the beginning, Charles Darwin was born in this house, the Mount, in Shrewsbury, in, in the middle of England, near a small market town. It's still a small market town today. It's, it's a big house because his, his family was very wealthy. These are his parents. His father, Robert Darwin, was a financier and physician and very, very fat. <laughs> he was so fat that he had to have a servant go into a house in, before him, uh, into, a, uh, into a patient's house, to jump up and down and check the floorboards were strong enough <laughs> to withstand the entry of, the, of Dr. Darwin. But Dr. Darwin was an immensely wealthy man. Most of his money was actually made from lending money. So that's why I think he should actually be called a financier and doctor, rather than the other way around. But he, but he was a doctor. On the other side is Darwin's mother. This is uh, Susanna Darwin, aged about 19. This is a very tiny, miniature, hand-painted portrait, still in family possession uh, in, in Cambridge. And it's beautiful. And the, the, the amazing thing about it is she looks exactly like Charles Darwin, except without the beard, <laughs> which is perhaps not a compliment for a 19-year-old woman, which <laughs> that's how old she is when this uh, portrait was painted. Now, it's often 
very often been repeated that the death of Darwin's mother when he was only eight years old left him psychologically scarred or traumatized or something to that effect for the rest of his life. And I can say nothing more about that other than there is absolutely no evidence for that belief whatsoever. All we have is an absence of any information about Darwin's feelings towards his mother. In later life, he could barely remember her. And that's all we have. So I think a lot has been read, at, read into that very little bit of evidence. And of course, once something enters the literature on Darwin, it gets repeated and repeated and repeated, and it becomes a fact. It be it's become what is believed to be a fact. Now, Darwin was a, led a very happy childhood, a privileged upbringing, wealthy family, many servants who took care of him. So he, wasn't, he wouldn't have been raised by his mother in the way that you might expect. He had maid servants and elder sisters who did the day-to-day the -day rearing of this young, man, this young child. Already in this early, earliest of all portraits of Darwin, he's depicted with a potted plant on his lap. Already he's becoming a proto-naturalist from his earliest days. He attends the local grammar school just down the road in Shrewsbury. It was actually one of the finest grammar schools in England at the time. But of course, an education at that time meant the classics, learning Greek, uh, studying the Greek New Testament and the ancient poetry and things like that. His father took him out of uh, school rather early in 1825 and proposed that Darwin become a physician like himself. So for that, Edinburgh University was the place to go in Scotland. Here Darwin was with his brother, elder brother Erasmus, who was taking a one year gap year away from Cambridge to upgrade his medical studies because Cambridge really wasn't good enough. Uh, but Edinburgh was a top place to study medicine. So Darwin went up with Erasmus. They, they lived there together for a year. And in the second year, Darwin was there by himself. But his heart wasn't in it. Medicine wasn't the thing for him. He couldn't stand the sight of suffering, and he couldn't bear the sight of blood. And that remained with him for the rest of his life. So soon his father heard that Darwin didn't much like the idea of being a physician. And so he proposed a respectable alternative. You can become a clergyman. Darwin asked for some time to consider this. He wasn't very religious, but he wasn't irreligious. And he decided, yeah, OK, that, that sounds like a, a, good, a good future. After all, he'd only have to work one day a week on Sundays. <laughs> and the rest of the week, he could spend developing his natural history interests, collecting and experimenting. So in order to become a clergyman in the Church of England, it was necessary to get a BA degree from an English university. So Edinburgh was out, Cambridge was in. This is Christ College in Cambridge. The, uh, Cambridge had numerous colleges at the time, but the reason Darwin went to Christ was that it was practically a family college. His cousins were there. His brother was there. It was natural that Darwin would then follow them to Christ's. However, what is almost always stated about Darwin's time in Cambridge is also actually untrue. Darwin did not study divinity or theology at Cambridge. This was not a degree Darwin was enrolled for. Darwin was enrolled for an ordinary BA degree. Now, the BA degree was one of the prerequisites in order to study divinity for the Church of England. And after he had uh, obtained his BA degree, he could have studied divinity for holy orders, but he never did. So it's not, it's not correct to say that he studied theology. Oh, and just recently, uh, Darwin's student bills and other documents have been discovered at Christ, which is quite fun for someone like me because I'm at Christ College and I study Darwin. And for many years, they told me there was nothing else to be found. There was an admissions book with his name, and that was it. And I kept prodding the archivist. Oh, come on, there's got to be something else from Darwin. And eventually, in uh, sorting through mountains of, of old documents and putting them in order, he did indeed find uh, numerous uh, record books. These have just gone online within the last few weeks. And you can find them all on Darwin Online. They're quite fun. You can see how much Darwin paid for his vegetables, his <laughs> library books, um, to have his hair cut, to have coal for his room, numerous other things. And there's also a little fragment which appears to be, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a tablecloth bill pinned to one of the pieces of paper. But if you take off the, pill, uh, the pin and look at the back, it says Agrotat Darwin, which was a Cambridge word meaning a sick note for Darwin. Now, you know, 200 years ago, somebody ripped a piece of paper off to write tablecloth bill, stuck it on there, and it has something to do with a sick note for a Darwin, but it might be his brother. We don't really know. This is the room where Darwin lived at Christ's, 
And this is how the room appeared in 1909, the last time we celebrated Darwin in this way. And this has been the only photograph, essentially, in print of Darwin's rooms at Christ for 100 years. And I've been fortunate enough to be involved with the restoration of Darwin's rooms this time around. And we did a lot of research in order to discover what they really looked like in Darwin's day. And I've brought along two sneak peek photographs for you. Here's one. The, the paneling was painted in Darwin's day. It wasn't bare wood, bare oak, as you often think that's what it looked like uh, back then. It was, in fact, it was in fact painted this exact color because we found microscopic traces of it. And it's furnished in a way that is very plausible for Darwin's day. And in the background, in the center of the photograph, is a cabinet which I found in the possession of a descendant of Darwin who's uh, in Cambridge, Milo Keynes. And it closely resembles Darwin's description of his beetle cabinet, which he had specially made when he lived in these rooms. So it's possible that it could be the actual one. And if it is, it's come home to these rooms for the first time in 178 years, which is quite fun. Uh, this is another view of the room. You can see that in, apart from the shotgun hanging on the wall, which was sort of the usual student equipment in Darwin's day, Apparently also in this university, because on the door of the library it says no firearms, which I think, <laughs> uh, okay. Perhaps they said the same in Darwin's day, leave your shotgun at the door. But, but Darwin often practiced with his shotgun in his rooms. It was a percussion shotgun, so without loading it with powder and shot, he would just put a percussion cap on the nipple and pull back the hammer. And a friend would move a lighted candle around, and Darwin would follow it. And if his aim was accurate, when he pulled the trigger, the puff of air that came out would extinguish the candle flame. This is apparently a great game for Darwin, and he, 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 seemed to, he seemed to have done this for hours on end, <laughs> such that the, he heard through the grapevine that the tutor of the college said, what an extraordinary thing it is that Mr. Darwin seems to spend hours cracking a horse whip in his rooms, <laughs> because he heard this cracking sound under Darwin's windows, the very window you see in the photograph there. But even more interesting from, a, from an archaeological perspective is what we actually found in the room. You see that in the window in the back left of the corner here, there's a seat cushion. There are two windows just like this one on the other side. And these seat cushions are, are made of horsehair, and they're very, very old. And they were covered with layer upon layer upon layer upon layer of seat cushion covers that were just stitched one on top of the other. And we went down to the lowest layer, and the pattern and the fabric and the dyes, etc., are correct for Darwin's time. So they may actually be the original seat cushion covers that Charles Darwin sat on and spilled his wine on as a student in these rooms. And we took that fabric and we had it reconstructed, or reprinted. And we used this fabric then to make the curtains, which is how it would have been done. You would have had a, a single kind of cloth made to furnish your rooms. So it's, it's, it's quite fun to see. I invite all of you to come and see it if you come to Cambridge this year. It's open to the public just for this year. Uh, so don't miss it. Well, of course, after the Voyage of the Beagle, uh, after, after his time at Christ, Darwin goes on the Voyage of the Beagle. It's the most famous event in Darwin's life. It precludes studying divinity. He never becomes a clergyman. Instead, he sails around the world on a Royal Navy surveying ship whose mission is to make maps mostly of the southern half of the South American continent and also to carry uh, a series of uh, measurements around the, the globe. Now, another commonly asserted thing about Charles Darwin, which has become fashionable in about the last 20 years, and really, basically, it's become an, another orthodoxy. And you can show you know what you're talking about if you say, well, you know, Darwin wasn't really the naturalist on the Voyage of the Beagle. He was the, gentleman, he was the captain's gentleman dining companion. And this has just become a new orthodoxy. But actually, the old-fashioned view of 100 years ago, I think, I believe, is more correct to say that Darwin actually was the naturalist on the Voyage of the Beagle. Because uniquely on the voyage of the Beagle, no officer, as Fitzroy rather angrily reminded Darwin after the voyage, no officer was required to collect on our voyage uniquely. And I believe the reason that was so was because the, the Admiralty knew that there was a specialist going to perform that duty. So that means that the, ship, the ship's surgeon, who would normally, generally in those days, be expected to form the office of a naturalist, was not required to do so. And he wasn't replaced when he left the voyage. Another reason is this. This is the list that Captain Fitzroy gave in his book after the voyage of the people on board the Beagle. This is the second page. These are the extras on board, the supernumeraries. First in the list, Charles Darwin, naturalist. That's how Darwin referred to him. Uh, that's how Fitzroy referred to him. 
the other, other points are in Darwin's uh, diary during the voyage of the Beagle. He, 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 he described how, what a pleasure it was that what had been for so many years his greatest hobby, uh, doing natural history, was now doing his duty. And what a great thing it was that doing his hobby was now doing his duty. Uh, in another place, uh, Darwin mentions, this is the first page of the first work that Darwin published on the Voyage of the Beagle. This is the Zoology of the Voyage of the Beagle, published later. And in the last sentence here, Darwin is telling the story of how he came to be on the Beagle and what it was all about. And he says, uh, in consequence of Captain Fitzroy, etc., etc., through the kindness of the hydrographer, my appointment received the sanction of the Admiralty, which I think is the proper answer to those who say that Darwin wasn't the official naturalist, which is really an anachronism because nobody in the Beagle was called official, um, except for the artists. People are happy to call them official. The other point is, of course, that Darwin spent only 30% of the voyage of the Beagle on the Beagle. He spent the rest, most of the time on land. So if he was supposed to be the captain's companion, he was a really bad one because he spent most of his time leaving Fitzroy alone. Well, this is a map that shows m some of the uh, major inland expeditions that Darwin carried out in, in South America. While he did so, he had these notebooks in his, well, he had one of these notebooks in his pocket. Now, 15 of them, they're very tiny, they're about, they're about this size. Very tiny, very hard to read. And what we see in these notebooks is the transformation of Charles Darwin as he becomes a more and more skilled and competent naturalist in many areas of natural science, particularly in geology, but also in zoology and entomology. And also, he becomes a theorist. He, become, he begins to theorize in these notebooks about what he's seeing. He begins to theorize about the history of the world. How is it that the plains of Patagonia came to be shaped like this? So observation and recording and measuring and theorizing began to diverge, and eventually, uh, one of these notebooks, the one in the bottom left corner, the Santiago notebook, was set aside to be just a notebook for theory. And he stopped carrying it around in the field. And other notebooks were carried around in the field instead. And just for fun, the notebook in the top left corner is the famous red notebook. You'll notice that it's brown. <laughs> that, that's a mystery that uh, I don't think anyone's cracked yet. Now, most famously, of course, the Beagle sailed to the Galapagos Islands. Now, the really shocking thing is, and I'm glad you're sitting down, the shocking, disappointing thing is that the, the role of the Galapagos Islands in Darwin's life and theory is grotesquely exaggerated. I mean, it's a real shame because it's a fantastic story. It used to be my favorite part anyway. Um, but the truth is that when Darwin died and his contemporaries began to tell the story of his life, particularly in hundreds of obituaries and many biographies, they told his story in a different way, usually without ever mentioning the Galapagos Islands or just listing them as one place in a list of important places that he visited. Now, it seems to us unimaginable to tell the story of Darwin's life and not mention the Galapagos Islands. I mean, in, in modern stories, it's basically the pivotal moment. So it is possible to tell Darwin's story in a different way because it was done so for very many years. The other thing that, of course, we already know, historians have known, since 1982, that Darwin didn't have a eureka moment when he was in the Galapagos Islands. He didn't see the beaks of these finches and go, aha, evolution, and have a eureka moment. We know that didn't happen. What we, what we didn't know is, OK, if that's not what Darwin said and that's not what happened, which, and it didn't happen, then how is it that by the late 20th century, everyone in the world believed that he did? If, it, if Darwin never wrote this, where did it come from? And I recently um, began chasing down this little mystery, trying to figure out where it actually came from. I mean, many people thought it came from this illustration in the second edition of Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle. These are four Galapagos finches. Well, if that was the case, that it was published in Darwin's own book, you would expect that belief to have been there ever since Darwin published it. But instead, it only came around, as far as I could tell, from about the 1930s or so. Well, OK, that can't be it. Um, in fact, it comes from around 1935, which was the centenary of Darwin's visit to the Galapagos. The, da the Galapagos was a famous place, and it was associated with Darwin because he had made most people familiar with it because of his beautiful account of his visit there. But what was not made was a connection between Darwin's visit to the Galapagos and discovering evolution. Nobody had done that before. But um, somebody made a little fudge here at the 
announcement of the meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science in, in 1935, where they've simply linked together, perhaps to sex up the title of the session where this was discussed, that it was celebrating the centenary of the landing of Charles Darwin in the Galapagos and of the birth of the hypothesis of the origin of species. And thereby sort of accidentally linking these two ideas together, it could be mi misread or actually quite plainly read as if that was what was being celebrated, the birth of the origin of species on the spot in the Galapagos. And this is from the Times. And from this newspaper alone, it was reproduced in hundreds of other newspapers and magazines around the world. And from there, on and on it went. In the same year, by wonderful coincidence, and at the same meeting, the term Darwin's finches was coined by an English uh, ornithologist, but not because he thought they were the origin of Darwin's theory, but he thought they were a particularly puzzling group of birds that, he didn't, that no one at his time thought that natural selection could explain. Why should they be like this? They're a great puzzle, and Darwin uh, was the first to capture and describe these, so he named them after, after Darwin. But more famously, in 1947, this very important book by David Lack called Darwin's Finches really did crack the puzzle and showed that natural selection wasn't, was, the, was the explanation for why the finches were the way they were, and that the finches' beaks were a beautiful example of adaptive radiation. So nowadays, most people, when they tell the story of the finches in the Galapagos and Darwin, they're actually talking about what Lack found out, but attributing it to Darwin, which is a bit of a shame because Lack deserves the credit. So by the, by the mid 20th century, the myth that, that this great event had happened in the Galapagos was really solidifying, and you begin to find it everywhere. Here's a book from 1962, the heroic Darwin standing in the Galapagos, staring into the future, about to make a great discovery, unfortunately suffering from terrible hair loss for a 26-year-old. It seems impossible to represent Darwin as a young man. <laughs> this is a, a scene from the BBC series The Voyage of Charles Darwin from 1978. Here's Darwin in the poop cabin of the Beagle, just leaving the Galapagos with his servant in the foreground. And in the desk in front of him, he has the Galapagos finches all lined up. And he's holding two in his hand, and he's just saying, oh, look at this, Covington. See how their beaks all line up, <laughs> thus telling an audience of millions that's how it did it. He just had to go to the Galapagos, line them up, and he got the idea. And of course, the, the, the finches have become absolutely synonymous with evolution. They've been on stamps and books and mugs, and it's, it's, it's endless. But actually, what Charles Darwin really did notice while he was in the Galapagos Islands was that the mockingbirds were different on different islands. He didn't notice that about the finches. In fact, he didn't even know they were finches. He thought they were loads of different kinds of birds. And it actually had to wait until Darwin got back to England for an expert ornithologist to actually make sense of what he'd collected. How could Darwin have known? He couldn't compare the things he collected on these remote islands with an international collection. He didn't have one. But when he got back home, John Gould was able to do that and was able to tell Darwin for the first time, these are unique species to the Galapagos. They're not found anywhere else. Oh, said Darwin, that's interesting. And then the finches began to have an impact on Darwin's uh, formative evolutionary theories. But the most important thing to say about the Galapagos is that they are not the place, they're not the one, they're one of three. Charles Darwin was asked a few times in his, at the end of his life, where did your theory come from? What, what, what made you come up with that? What, what was behind it? What, what, was, what inspired you? And he always listed three things. One was the species on the Galapagos. Another was the unearthing of fossil creatures, extinct fossil creatures in South America that was strikingly similar or reminiscent of things that only live in South America today. This is an example of one. That uh, little illustration on the right is from Darwin's book, The Zoology of the Beagle, the section of the armor plating of a glyptodon, which Darwin thought was strangely reminiscent of the armored little creatures running around his, at his feet, but not seen anywhere else in the world. So, thirdly was the geographical distribution, the spacing out of species as he traveled southward down the continent. And there are many examples that Darwin have recorded during the voyage. This is just the most famous one. which These are the, the South American rayas or the South American ostriches. And Darwin found that there were two very similar but distinct species with adjoining or, or slightly overlapping ranges. Now, why should that be, that one species should just sort of peter out and a similar but different one should begin? 
Why should that be? Darwin couldn't see that the environment could explain that. He didn't hit on a, on a solution for any of these things. They were all just puzzles, which he, he thought about until he got home. So he did get home. In October 1836, the Beagle returned home, and Darwin began to put pieces of this puzzle together. The Beagle notebooks that he'd had in his pocket all along, he put those aside, and he opened a new set of notebooks, the evolution notebooks or the transmutation notebooks. This is one of them, notebook B. And in a way, they're really descended from those Beagle notebooks that he used to carry in his pocket, because they're also carried in his pocket. He takes them with him everywhere he goes. And as he had done in the Beagle voyage, when he reads something, when he hears something in conversation, when he gets new information or new thoughts, he could pull out his notebook and enter the information. And so it was actually in England, after he returned home, that Darwin began to come up with his theory of evolution. It struck him that, uh, through his reading of Malthus, that clearly any species could breed enough in a few hundred generations to, to, to completely cover the, the entire globe. And that doesn't happen. Why not? Well, the reason it doesn't happen is that there are checks. Therefore, almost everything that is being born, and you have to consider things like pollen, seeds, and eggs, almost all of them are destroyed. It, that has to be so, because if they weren't, they would fill the, any one of them would fill the entire globe, but they don't do so. They remain stable. Therefore, almost all are being destroyed. Therefore, only a tiny minority are making it through the gauntlet. And Darwin thought perhaps there might be something special about those tiny few who managed to make it through. Also, he was aware of the, 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 the omnipresence of variation, that organisms are not identical copies. They're all different and slightly vary. So maybe those few that make it through might be the ones that happened to vary in, in a way that allowed them to get through, that gave them the right stuff. Therefore, it, in an analogy with breeders, selecting which animals to breed from in order to promote that kind of stock or that kind of plant, nature could indeed do the same thing. And natural forms could change over time and diverge and adapt to an environment. OK. I mean, that's Darwin's theory in a nutshell. But Darwin has come up with his theory between 1837 and 1839, or he's come up with most of it. It's not finished. And here we come across the next, the next big legend or myth, which is Darwin's delay. Darwin comes up with his theory in the 1830s, the late 1830s. He doesn't publish it until 1858 or 1859. Now, there's a gap between those two dates of 20 years. Now, for, in recent decades, it's been very widely believed, almost universally believed, that Darwin, that this gap existed because Darwin was afraid to tell people what he believed, that he held it back, that he concealed it, uh, that he kept it a secret. In fact, this has now become, like the Finches, another one of these iconic things to say about Charles Darwin, that this is what his life was about. It was about concealment, fear, and secrecy. This is the homepage of the American Museum of Natural History's wonderful Darwin exhibition, uh, but what do they say in this particular page about Darwin? For 21 years, he kept his theory secret. Similarly, the Natural History Museum in London, this is the image they've chosen for Darwin. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. I believe in evolution. Well, this has a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that go along with it. For example, Darwin recorded a dream in 1838 in which a man was hung and then came back to life, etc., etc. And this has been interpreted since the 1970s, when a psychologist first put this new interpretation on it, that it's actually about Charles Darwin himself dreaming that he is being executed, not someone else. So that it's a persecution dream in a Freudian sense. In 2001, in the PBS documentary, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, this interpretation of the dream was actually brought to life on the screen. And here's a, here's a clip of the gallows. And in the next scene, you actually see Charles Darwin physically being dragged to the gallows by the anatomist Richard Owen and Captain Fitzroy. So in the next scene, the rope is put around Darwin's neck, a hood over his head, and the doors drop. And the screen goes black. And in the next scene, Darwin wakes up in bed, covered in sweat. Oh, oh dear. And his wife is patting his brow. And she says, oh, what's the matter? And he says, oh, this book is going to be the death of me, meaning the origin of species, the book that he's working on in secret, in private. Well, what did Darwin really say? This is the original recording of the dream in Darwin's notebook. And I've just highlighted the words that contradict that interpretation in red. 
So you say, I was witty in a dream. A person, a third person, had his head cut off. This was a kind of wit. All of this was a kind of wit. There was a feeling of banter and joking. Now, the passage is overwhelmingly about wit and joking rather than one of fear and feeling uh, persecution. The dream is really about, uh, the recording of the dream is really about Darwin's interest in the physiology of dreams and how memory works. That's why Darwin is writing, writing that down. And I think that's a much simpler explanation. OK, this is the first page of The Origin of Species, published in 1859. What did Darwin tell his readers? He says, on the first page, after I came home from the voyage of the Beagle, in 1837, I began working on this subject. And then I, I, I put together a sketch in 1842, and in 1844, a longer sketch. And from that period to the present day, I have steadily pursued the same object. That's what Darwin told his readers on the first page of The Origin of Species. I was working on it. I'm still working on it. That was Darwin's published official statement. The other problem with the secrecy view is that if you actually do troll through all of Darwin's correspondence, all of Darwin's scientific notes and scraps from this gap period and the diaries of others, et cetera, et cetera, looking for evidence of people who were told by Charles Darwin that he believed in evolution, you can put together quite a long list. And I'm, I'm putting one together. This list, about 50 people, includes most of his family, friends, and scientific colleagues. And given the fact that most of the material from that time doesn't survive, but what does survive gives us such a lengthy list, it would seem that it's impossible to describe Charles Darwin as keeping his theory a secret when this, many num this number of people are told. But I think the nail in the coffin of the secret view is in The Origin of Species itself in the sixth and last edition published in 1872. This is it. That Darwin is trying to defend himself from the claim that, oh, you're always exaggerating your originality. Everyone believes in evolution nowadays. It's not such a big deal. It wasn't so new. And Darwin wants to defend himself from that. He wants to say, well, yes, it was. It was quite new when I published in 1859. And this is his evidence for it. In those years before I published, I formally spoke to very many naturalists on the subject of evolution and never once met with any sympathetic agreement, which would seem to be done and dusted. What about that famous letter where Darwin says, when he first telling one of his friends about his belief in evolution, it is like confessing a murder. Now, this is one of the most famous Darwin quotes in the world today. It didn't used to be. It's been in print since 1887. And it's, on, it's even the title of many books now. Nowadays, it is read to be almost a literal statement that Darwin is saying that it's such a serious terrifying thing to tell his correspondent that he believes in evolution, that it is really, literally, like confessing a murder. But I think this passage, in a way, is being read out of context. If you read Charles Darwin's entire correspondence and compare the way he uses words like murder, hang, kill, suicide, battle, torture, etc., you'll find that Darwin commonly uses words like this in a slightly melodramatic way for humorous effect. Hate. You are a real Christian if you do not hate me forever and ever. Do not hate me too much for bothering you. Or suicide. You ask about my book, Insectivorous Plants, and all that I can say is that I'm ready to commit suicide, i.e. because it's too much work. Murder. I suppose that any remaining birds must be killed and eaten, but I feel that is something like murder. I grieve to say that the plant looks more unhealthy. And if it dies, I shall feel like a murderer. Or finally, I forgot whether I ever told you that I had long considered the Scotch deerhound a mongrel par excellence. Don't tell any Scotch so, or I shall be murdered. And finally, this is my favorite. When I saw your bundle of observations, I felt as if I had committed theft, arson, or murder. Now, this is about a trivial bit of, uh, of note taking. This passage is 10 times stronger than the oft-quoted, like confessing a murder. Now, I think when you put them all in context, ah, it can be read in another way. And indeed, for over 100 years, that letter was read in a different way. It was not read as evidence for fear. How did Darwin actually treat secrets? I mean, there were things that were, Darwin kept secret, and you can search through his correspondence and find them. Here's one. What Darwin is writing, uh, I have a very long interview with Owen, which perhaps you would like to hear about. But please, repeat nothing. This is underlined twice, right? Or um, 
Furthermore, it was a convention in Darwin's day that if something was a secret, was to remain private, couldn't be told to anyone else, and couldn't be published, you would mark the letter private. Darwin does that plenty of times, as do many people of his time. But none of the letters that talk about his belief in evolution in the gap period are marked private. So, so what was Darwin, what was he actually up to? And this is what he says in his autobiography at the end of his life. And this passage has been interpreted to mean that oh, here Darwin is simply saying that he, he delayed, that he held it back. I gained much by my delay in publishing from about 1839 when the theory was clearly conceived to 1859, and I lost nothing by it, for I cared very little whether men attributed most originality to me or Wallace. Well, in the very same document, Darwin refers to the delays of two of his other books, Oh, sorry, I've skipped, a, I've skipped a, a stage, which is, of course, that the word delay in that passage has two distinct possible meanings. It could be one meaning or it could be the other. Both of them are, are perfectly plausible. One, it means I gain much by my conscious postponement of my theory, or two, um, the time that happened to elapse from thinking of the theory to publishing it. But there are two other references to delays of other books in the same document. Here's one of them. Uh, I began arranging my notes in 1860. But it was not until published in the beginning of 1868, the delay having been caused partly by frequent illnesses, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the delay in this passage doesn't mean the time I was holding it back or avoiding. This means the time that happened to elapse. And secondly, about his book, Insectivorous Plants, was published in 1875, that is 16 years after my first observations. The delay in this case, as with all my other books, has been a great advantage to me, for a man after a long interval can criticize his own work almost as well as if it were that of another man. So this is what Darwin is doing. This green line represents Darwin's Beagle publications. Darwin comes home from the Beagle voyage, and his full-time occupation is preparing and publishing books and articles, etc., on all the thousands of specimens and his ex experiences on the voyage of the Beagle. It's a very big project. The arrow is pointing at 1844. That's the point when Darwin writes up the 230-page rough draft of his theory of evolution. Now, if, if he delayed or held it back or put it off, you would be thinking it would be from that time onwards, because here he's got a rough sketch. Well, this is it. This is the first page of the 1844 essay by Darwin. Now, what he did with this was he, his handwriting was very bad, it was very messy, uh, he sent it to the local village schoolmaster to do this, to make a copy of it. This is what you did before photocopies. You paid someone else to write it up. Well, if this manuscript was considered to be a, a, a terrible secret that could destroy his reputation, sending it out to have it commercially copied is utterly inexplicable. Another book comes out in 1844, the same year, but after Darwin has had that manu manuscript copied and laid it aside. This, uh, this is a, the cosmic pot boiler vestiges of creation, which in a way isn't, I think Darwin wouldn't have directly compared with his own work in the sense that Darwin considered himself a serious elite scientist, and this he thought was the work of a hack who had just got, crammed together lots of science, made loads of mistakes, and was getting lots of attention. And this person kept his identity secret. And how did he keep his identity secret? He wrote up the manuscript of his book, he gave it to his wife for her to copy, so no one would recognize his handwriting. She copied the whole thing out, and then that, handwrite, that handwritten script was sent to a friend in, in another city, and that friend then sent it to the publisher. That's how you handle a secret manuscript. You don't let anyone allow, find out that you're the one who's written it. Now, it's very often claimed that it was the re reception of this book that made Darwin hold back. Unfortunately, there is no evidence for that statement no matter how often it is repeated, what, where is the evidence? All you can find is Darwin writing in his notes, he'll say, mm, well, in the light of vestiges, make this point like this. He simply responds by slightly adjusting how he is proceeding. There is nowhere any evidence of holding back, delaying, or fear of the reaction against his own theory. So Darwin, in, a, in another letter to a friend, refers to what he's up to and when he's going to get to the species theory. And from that, you can put together a diagram like this. In November 1845, he's projecting yeah, beagle work will be proceeding, but when I finish it, 
I'll start on the species theory. And he thought it would take him about five years to work up the species theory and publish it. Now, if you project that ahead, you get a date of around 1853. That's when Darwin, at that time, thought he would publish his theory of evolution. But of course, Darwin was very busy. Since he returned home from the Voyage of the Beagle, he published the, uh, the Journal of Researchers, or Voyage of the Beagle, in 1839, and an extensively revised edition in 1845. That's the, the smaller red one. Then there were the five volumes of the Zoology of the Voyage of the Beagle, the first volume on fossil mammals, the second on mammals, the third on birds. Actually, this image appears in your pamphlet on science. I'm wondering if it's the same one. And another volume on fish, and finally one on reptiles, although they also stuck amphibians in the same volume because they didn't know where else to put them. Uh, then Darwin worked, did another three volumes on the geology of the Voyage of the Beagle. Three volumes, the first, his famous theory of the formation of coral reefs. The second, the volcanic islands visited during the Voyage of the Beagle. And thirdly, the geology of South America. Major contributions to the geology of his time. Well, Darwin was almost finished in the late 1840s with his uh, beagle work. He only had a few more things to do, marine invertebrates. Those he didn't give to another expert, as he did the others I just showed. The marine invertebrates he kept to himself because they were his own area of expertise. Ever since he'd been in Edinburgh, Darwin had been an expert on marine invertebrates. And the majority of these zoological notes kept on the voyage of the beagle pertain to this subject. So Darwin planned to publish them himself. He thought he would spend a few years writing papers, and then he would get on to the species theory. Unfortunately for him, uh, the, this process of working up some of these final specimens turned into a much bigger project than he originally conceived, which became his great monograph on, uh, on the barnacles, on the, on the two great classes, and uh, two slim works on fossil British species. A complete list. The nature of a complete list is that e even after you're three quarters of the way through and you're sick to death of it, you can't stop because it's not complete yet. So Darwin, while he was making wonderful and exciting discoveries in the early years and loved the barnacle research, finally he wasn't just writing books, he was actually working with specimens again, he loved it. But after a few years and it was dragging on, his health wasn't very good, he was sick to death of them and he wanted to get rid of them. He told a friend, I, I loathe barnacles. I hate barnacles like no man who ever lived, even more than a sailor on a slow sailing ship which is very serious hatred indeed. <laughs> and of course, Darwin was all the while publishing other scientific contributions in periodicals. So Darwin is an extremely busy man. And in the background of all that front ground activity, he's reading and still collecting evidence on his theory of evolution to be published when he finishes projects in hand. And then, of course, that happens in 1859 in the origin of species. But again, here again, there are countless myths about what the origin of species is actually about, what Darwin actually says, what the book is. Even the title of the book is very often misquoted. It's often called Origin of the Species, which I think uh, is often believed to mean that it's the origin of our species. But that's not what the book is about at all. It's about the general process of how life changes over time. Now this is a diagram from the Reverend Buckland's Bridgewater Treatise from 1837. That is just when Darwin got back from the Beagle voyage. And what this depicts is the state of the art knowledge of the day. And what this shows us today is that no one, no scientist in Darwin's day believed that the world was 6,000 years old. That was utterly antiquated. They all knew that the Earth was really, really old. They didn't know how old it was. They had no way of dating it. But they, they, they knew absolutely it was incredibly old. And they knew that it was filled, filled with countless eras of previous life, and that these rock, rocks were the same where everyone went in the world. And the fossils are represented on the top of the diagram. And the amazing thing was that they were always arranged in a progressive series, that the more ancient rocks contained more primitive forms of life, and then as one moved up through the geological time, more complex, as they called them, creatures emerged. First there were fish. At first there were shells, then there were fish, then there were amphibians, then there were reptiles, then there were mammals, but of extinct types that no one had ever seen. And only in the most recent rocks were there mammals of types resembling, or indeed the same, as any alive today. But nowhere in all of that had anyone ever found a human fossil. So they knew 
that this countless eras of life that existed on the earth before, before now were worlds without human beings in them. That was the state of knowledge in Darwin's day. That was universally accepted in the scientific community, except for one man, Charles Lyell. He did not accept this. He loathed the idea of a progressive theory of, the, of life uh, and of, uh, of the history of the earth. He thought it would lead to an evolutionary view, which he didn't want to have happen. But all the other people, all of these orthodox Christian scientists who had pieced together the earth, earth, history of the earth like this were not evolutionists. They just spread this in completely different ways, many different ways. Many different eras of creation, for example, was one common theory. So this is where we are when Darwin comes out. Uh, so in a way, Darwin really connects the dots rather than sweeping away everything that is known before. Darwin's other great work is, of course, The Descent of Man, published in 1871, where he, he, he really does address in detail the origins of mankind. And this sets off a whole new series of myths and legends about Charles Darwin. He's been uh, ridiculed ever since this, that day as the monkey man, the man who says, we, you know, Darwin says we come from monkeys. I've heard many people say this. What did Darwin say? Oh, you know, he's the one who said we come from monkeys. And Darwin never said we come from monkeys. Here's a recent uh, issue of The Sun, which is a British newspaper, I think a bit like the National Enquirer, but I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, this is an insurance fraudster whose name actually is John Darwin. And he wore a false beard as a disguise to escape detection. And the son just couldn't resist comparing John Darwin to Charles Darwin. There's no relation, by the way. And in the lower panel, to remind their readers who Charles Darwin was, they say, you know, the faker was not aping 19th century boffin Charles, who discovered humans are descended from monkeys. There you go. Now you, under now you remember who Darwin was. This is a sketch that Darwin actually drew around uh, 1860, in 1868, and it's not to scale and the lines don't all end in the same place, but what it shows you is that Darwin's actual belief was that the primates are related to one another by common descent, not lineal descent, in the, which is what Lamarck would have said, that a monkey became an ape and then an ape became a human. Darwin believed that we all share these characteristics because we've all commonly branched off from a similar ancestor. What, that's, what that common ancestor was, was a, a primitive tree-dwelling thing. Uh, but it was something that preceded the monkeys, preceded the apes, preceded the lemurs for Darwin. That was, what he, that was the state of knowledge in his day. Uh, I think finally, perhaps, and also ubiquitous, is this myth, the deathbed conversion myth. It's very widely believed that on his deathbed, Darwin said, oh, only kidding. <laughs> I take it all back. Sorry. Just kidding. Forget it. As if it would make any difference if Darwin said that or not. Uh, would that change the science that he had established during his life? No. But uh, this, this continues to circulate very widely that, yeah, Darwin took it all back, so you don't have to worry about it. Forget it. Uh, the other version is that Darwin became uh, a Christian on his deathbed. And after the voyage, he didn't. There's no evidence for that. And we know very well what he said as he died. His family was there. They were writing everything down. In fact, after Darwin came back from the voyage of the Beagle, uh, he was a young man, and he began to address all the big questions. How does life work? You know, um, is there an afterlife? He began to think of all these questions himself, as many young people do. And over a course of years, he decided that he didn't see that the evidence was sufficient to back up the claims of Christianity. So Darwin gradually, and without any distress over a long period, came to give up his belief in Christianity and never shifted from that point again. But he was not an atheist. He had given up his belief in Christianity, but he had not given up his belief that some intelligent thing may have started up nature in the first place. And he remained to the end of his life quite happy to believe something like that might be the case. What was important for him was that nature was, was regular and behaved according to fixed natural laws, and that a scientist like him could investigate and discover those natural laws to figure out how nature worked. So you see, it was actually quite a happy compatibility for many Victorians when Darwin's theory emerged that you can, yeah, well, of course you can believe in God and evolution. Many people asked Darwin this, can you believe in God and evolution? He got tired of answering it. Yes, you can, he would say. And here's a list of prominent people who do believe in both, so that you will believe me. Um, this is a fact. 
Uh, the other thing, of course, is that uh, while Darwin believed that, uh, that belief in God and evolution were perfectly compatible, many people in his, in his day didn't agree. But it is not the case, as one very often hears, that Darwin's book appeared uh, in November 1859, and there was a huge outcry and there was a hu enormous controversy. This is greatly overplayed. Yes, Darwin's book was uh, highly controversial and very widely uh, debated, but in fact, and this is the really sad thing, it's been forgotten today by us moderns that within about 20 years of the publication of The Origin of Species, the debate about evolution was over, not just in Britain, but around the world. The international scientific community almost universally considered Charles Darwin as the great figure who had sorted out, who had solved this great puzzle of nature. And he was lauded and appreciated uh, like no other living figure. And when he died, consequently was revered and celebrated like no one else uh, of the age, because it was believed he had changed our understanding of nature and of life forever. So if you'd like to know more about Darwin, of course, you can always read what he actually said, and rather than take a, a second opinion. And uh, that's why we've put together Darwin Online. Darwin's own website is now available online. <laughs> His entire publications uh, arranged and put on in one place for the first time, in addition to loads of other stuff. So if you're interested in finding out more about Darwin, I hope you'll have a look. Thank you very much. I'm sure Professor Van Wy will entertain questions, but please use the microphone that is available to, uh, to ask your question. Uh, you didn't mention at all the, his meeting up with the Amanas in, in South America and what influence it had on him, if any. I yeah. thought it had some, but you didn't seem to mention it at all. <laughs> No, well, I, oh, I, I omitted almost everything about the life of Charles Darwin because there's just not, no, it's just not time for me to do that. But you're right, uh, that was a, a very f uh, influential time for Darwin. Unfortunately, he didn't write about it in these uh, notebooks he had in his pocket. I think he was so stunned by what he was seeing that uh, he didn't write it down immediately. But what he was seeing, this polite, genteel young gentleman from Cambridge, was seeing what he called savages, real natural savages for the first time, naked people living in one of the coldest places on earth, sleeping in shallow ditches in the ground sometimes, eating and living like animals as he perceived them. He couldn't believe it. It was the most shocking thing he had ever seen. They grunted like animals. It was horrifying, but it was horrifying for another reason. It was horrifying for him simply to behold people who were like this, but it was horrifying also because he realized our ancestors were like these. Now, of course, every literate person, uh, English-speaking literate person of Darwin's day was aware of, of the writings of Julius Caesar. And when he conquered Britain, he found, or when he invaded Britain, he found that the people were dancing around savages painted blue. I mean, everyone, everyone remembered this. So, of course, it was obvious that a more primitive beginning lay behind the, the modern world. And this was showing Darwin re in real life, close up, a much earlier phase than that. The first meeting with them, though, was when the when his when on the Beagle the three of them were being brought back. So he spent the whole voyage with them. That he and they were sort of semi-civilized, to put it that oh, way. Oh, they were quite civilized. Yeah. They were well dressed, how, you know, polite, ate with a knife and fork. What was the reaction to them? And then meeting, you know. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, we have no information on that. Darwin spent all this time in the ship with them and never mentions them. Yeah. Only once. When they're staying on shore, farther north in South America, Darwin mentions the young woman, Fueja Basket, and says, uh, Fueja Basket daily increases in every dimension except height. <laughs> That's all he said. <laughs> you also, last one, you also don't mention much of his um, friendship or whatever companionship with Fitzroy. Mm. And I think, um, in the beginning, whether he's listed as a naturalist or whatever he's listed as official title, I think Fitzroy was looking for a companion because as a captain, 
you sort of have to be separate from everyone else, and he wanted someone. And he interviewed a number of people, and I think uh, Darwin was not the first one. Someone else had accepted and then backed out, and then Darwin was picked. Was that significant? Or it's, yes, that's, yeah. that's true that Fitzroy did, see, did consider someone else. But that's not the route by which Darwin comes to be on the, on the Beagle. Fitzroy uh, sends to his superiors a request for a naturalist. That's why the letter was sent to Cambridge University, not to find him a friend, uh, i.e. someone he's never met, from other people he's never met. The reason the letter goes to Cambridge via scientific men is to find the young man who is scientifically qualified to do this. And the men who consider it are naturalists, Henslow and Leonard Jennings. They're both friends of Darwin's, but they're a bit too old. Their careers are too settled. They have families. So they don't take it up. But they both recommend Darwin. He is just the man, because he is probably the best qualified man in England of his age, and who was capable, because he wasn't tied down yet with a career or family, to go on the voyage. And what a good choice he was. Hi there. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming all this way to give us this talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, second of all, you mentioned that Darwin wasn't really studying theology when we thought he was studying theology. Could you tell us more about the classes he did take? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, uh, well, in the little booklet I showed you at the beginning, um, which you can, I, I, it's very difficult to acquire. I think if you go to the website of Christ College, uh, you can find how to order it. It's, it doesn't cost very much. I think it's about five dollars. Um, uh, I reconstruct uh, Darwin's life in Cambridge in more detail than has ever done, been done before. I mean, what did he actually do there, right? And in the morning, you know, his servant would come in and wake him up in time for chapel across the courtyards, right? He'd come back, the bed maker had made his bed. The servant had laid his breakfast out in front of the fire, and he would have his breakfast. And after that were two hours of college lectures. And these were required, he had to go, but, and, and they consisted of mathematics, well, that's not me. <laughs> Turn your phones off. Um, two hours, one hour of mathematics, another of classics. And in this booklet, I show you an example of examination papers from Christ College from when Darwin was there. So you can actually see what Darwin was doing. I showed the classics examination paper to a professor of classics at the college. And he said, gosh, I couldn't do that. It was classics of extremely... Uh, high degree. You have to remember that these young men have been studying Greek since they were children. So the questions when he got to university level were incredibly intense. Hence, it is, as, re as is repeated in every biography of Darwin, he couldn't come up to Cambridge at first because he'd forgotten his Greek. But they never tell you why. What difference does that make? Who cares? You don't need Greek to drink port, do you? The reason he couldn't come to Cambridge without his Greek was that you had to engage in these lectures every day. And that was impossible if you weren't up to scratch with your Greek. You couldn't possibly take part in them because the questions were so, you had to analyze poems and break them down into their components, et cetera. You had to know the rules of the classical poetries and you had to understand uh, all of this. So that's what Darwin's actually doing. The curriculum consists of mathematics, classics, and moral philosophy. But all of that actually doesn't really count because the university, the college is, is this small entity like a little castle in the middle of the town, but the university is this virtual entity. And it's the university that awards the degree. And as far as the university is concerned, you have to do all your college things and, and meet all those requirements. You have to reside 10 months in Cambridge, which is why those college bills, one of the things they do is rec record that he's resident, re residing there. So it gives us some nice dates we didn't have otherwise. And secondly, you had to pass two examinations. The previous examination, or the so-called little go, in the second year, and the final examination in the final year. And you were tested on exactly the three things I just mentioned. And Charles Darwin passed 10th, number 10, in a list of 178 for students who didn't go in for honors. But of course, he did that by cramming. He didn't, he didn't much like his studies. He spent most of his time doing his natural history hobbies, especially collecting beetles. But he was a clever young man, and he got by through cramming. At what point did uh, science uh, disciplines enter the curriculum at university? Oh, that's, a, that's a question I probably can't answer off the top of my head. It's later in the 19th century. 
probably around the 1860s, but I'm probably wrong in my guess. Now, Darwin, of course, did take other uh, lectures in the university at the time, but they were extras. He had to pay extra, and they didn't count. So he took, for three years, he took Professor Henslow's botany lectures. He loved them, and he was particularly devoted to Professor Henslow. This was such a, a friendly, learned, helpful man, and Darwin thought he was so full of learning, he just absolutely adored him. And he learned a great deal from him about the practice of natural science. And he also took uh, Professor Sedgwick's geology lectures. So he, th he wasn't required to do so. No undergraduate was required to take the lectures of professors in the university. They were just extra. Uh, but jo Darwin did choose to do so. So he, he got as much science as he could out of Cambridge, even though it wasn't actually part of the official curriculum for his degree. He couldn't have, there was no science degree in his day. It was decades, decades later. Um, you mentioned earlier about Lyle, that, that he had a theory of evolution, that there was no straight line, uh, progressive evolution like, uh, like Darwin. Um, and, it, and, the, and that theme seems to, to have come out in, uh, in H.G. Wells's uh, The Time Machine, uh, where the, the, the people uh, w way down the road were, weren't very e evolved a, at all. Uh, in, in fact, that they had devolved. Was, the, was there any fierce battles uh, among evolutionists between those that, that, that thought that that there was a, a straight line progressive evolution in, in those that didn't? A straight line evolution in human evolution, do you mean? Yes, human evolution. In, okay. Uh, yes, <laughs> the short answer is yes. Of course, once Darwin published, in a way you can describe that as the end of the story, but really it's just the beginning of the story. And uh, you know, countless other scientists begin to apply Darwin's ideas in their own ways, not on, to blank slates, but according to the ideas and philosophies that they were already partial to. So what you find in the decades after Darwin is every possible description of way of uh, misreading, misusing, and misapplying his theory that, that could possibly be imagined. And well, of course, that continues to this day. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, not entirely, but well, thanks. <laughs> sorry. Two questions. One is um, about the status of evolution as an idea at the time that Darwin was beginning to put together his, his, his book. Uh, some have claimed that you know, Darwin shouldn't get credit for evolution because a number of other people had proposed it. Just be interested in your comments on, on that issue. And the second issue is uh, when Robert Richards visited, he tried to make the case, largely from Darwin's own writings, that Darwin was uh, in essence, a progressivist, meaning that he actually thought that evolution was leading to a particular endpoint, meaning perhaps us. Uh, I'd just be curious to know if you would agree with that or how you would evaluate that uh, argument. Okay, well, two very difficult questions. The first one was, if I'm summarizing correctly. What, yeah, what, so how, how do you view Darwin's was Darwin original? As an, as an originator of the, con I mean, clearly other people had mentioned evolution, but was there, was Erasmus Darwin's concept of evolution, that is his grandfather, yeah. not his brother, uh, or this other person, Patrick Matthew? And yes, that. okay, so how original is Charles Darwin? Did he come up with anything new at all? Oh, because there's loads of so-called precursors. Yes, there are loads of so-called precursors, but uh, I think, uh, no, I, th I think that Darwin is an originator of something new. And I think a large part of the confusion comes from our use of the word evolution to mean loads of stuff people back then used to think. They didn't use the word evolution, and they all had really different ideas. But because we use our modern term for all of them, unfortunately, it sounds like they're all talking about the same thing Darwin is talking about. In fact, they all have quite different ideas, uh, particularly Lamarck. I mean, Lamarck, I mean, you could have a talk just like this one about all the myths about Lamarck. Uh, you know, Lamarck's theory is not about the inheritance of acquired characteristics. I mean, every naturalist back then had some view that was you would call inheritance of acquired characteristics. There's nothing peculiar to Lamarck about that at all. Darwin had it too. Loads of them did. You know, there's nothing unique to Darwin about that. The thing that, that Lamarck had that was uh, peculiar to his system was that there was an inherent 
law of progress. That's how nature works for the mark. N living things are constantly striving upwards to progress up the chain of complexity, but it's a single line. So there are many instances of spontaneous generation still happening today, constantly happening. And they, each one of those in, develops upwards, develops upwards, and goes through. And so what appear to be extinct forms today aren't really extinct. It's just those are phases along the line of progression that nothing happens to be at right now. He couldn't bear to accept that extinction could be true. And then, of course, the inheritance of acquired characteristics he brought in to explain adaptation. So that creates a slight fuzziness on his lines, but not trees. Uh, and that's quite similar for several of the other thinkers. But Darwin is, I think, is special and is unique in his picture of branching descent. And I think, really, it doesn't get enough credit compared to natural selection. It's the, it's the glamorous one. But I really think that the, the, the real special thing is that he comes up with natural, uh, that he comes up with branching, branching descent, descent with modification. I mean, that's Darwin's first name, and most common, I think, name for his theory is descent with modification. So actually, natural selection, you know, by natural selection, as if it's an add-on to the process itself. The second question, is Darwin a progressivist? <laughs> That is a really, <laughs> a very difficult one. And I, I really don't know what I think about that because as uh, Bob Richards probably said in his talk, there are many ambiguous passages by Darwin which clearly state the opposite. In one sense, he says there's a, a progression is absurd. There's no, nothing of the kind. And in many other passages, he talks about progression. Uh, so I really don't know what to say about that. I think. He's a human being, he's complicated, he's got a mess in his head like most of us, and sometimes he thinks this and that. So perhaps there isn't actually an answer. Did he believe this or that? Well, on what day? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think I have two simple, short questions. Um, one, I've always been... Um, interested in what he wrote about earthworms. He got very excited. Was that at the end of his life? And uh, you know of what I'm speaking there. He really interested in them. And the other I saw in, the, in the, uh, some of the texts you had on the screen, uh, reference to Owen. And I wonder if that's Robert Owen, or if you know which, who that was, because that's someone I know who, who had a lot to do with paleontology. Do you know either yes. of those to speak on? Uh, earthworms, Darwin is first prompted to look into the, the action of earthworms in 1838. And he writes up a short paper about it, but then he carries on with his, his other projects. And it's over 40 years after that that he turns himself full time to that subject. Uh, and he publishes his, his final book on the actions of earthworms how it is that the tiny actions of earthworms create not only the soil that we depend on, but actually through these tiny cumulative actions, which is, of course, what Darwinism is all about, tiny, minuscule actions which cumulatively make a vast impact. They completely shape the landscape around us. They make historical monuments gradually sink below the, the, the surface as the urms push up their castings just a millimeter or two at a time on the surface, slowly rise rising above and the other things sink down, rounding the surfaces of hills, making the landscape more gentle, and on and on, on, aerating the soil, helping plants to grow. Darwin found that these tiny, insignificant things under our feet were, in fact, incredibly important. And he says at near the end of that book that it is a pity that so many people have a problem understanding evolution. And the reason is the same they're unable to appreciate the significance of earthworms, that they're not able to take the step of realizing what the cumulative power of very many tiny actions can ultimately achieve given very deep time. And secondly, the figure was Richard Owen, Richard. the uh, anatomist and paleontologist. Yes, a very, very eminent figure in Darwin's day. They were friends, and he published that first volume, uh, sorry, he wrote the first volume of the Zoology of the Beagle on the fossil mammals. And it's only after the publication of The Origin of Species when Owen became rather a nasty man and they were no longer friends. Well, thank you.
Thank you all very much. And uh, if any of you have more questions, you can come up and speak to uh, Yes, individually. Thank you. Thank you.